All right, in Elihu, you remember we go through the, the three cycles of speeches. Zophar doesn't speak at the end of the third cycle. And then Elihu breaks in in chapter 32. And in verses 1 to 5, we have Elihu who in verse 6, he informs us he's the son of Barakel, the Bozite, for whatever that's worth to us. And he comes out of nowhere. He was a silent observer of this dispute between Job and the three friends because he was young and he deferred to the elders. But he can no longer tolerate the failure of these three friends to convict Job of his culpability in the suffering that has come upon him. He just can't tolerate any longer their failure to make Job cry uncle. And he says in verses 6 to 10 that he was afraid to pipe up because of his youth. And then he announces there really wasn't any basis for his reluctance to speak because wisdom is not a matter of age, but really a matter of divine inspiration. Old people aren't privileged regarding wisdom, he says in verse 9. Rather, it's those like him who've been gifted with divine insight. See, so that's his claim. He claims to be inspired, or at least quasi-inspired. That's, that's his thing. That's why they need to listen to him, he says in verse 10, despite his youth, because he has this gift from God. He says in, in 11 to 15, he says he was disappointed in their failure to convict Job and in their becoming discouraged and giving up before the, having done so. And then in 16 and 17, their giving up, he says, helped motivate him to intervene. That's why he's now jumping in the fray. In the second part of verse 14, he says that he, he won't answer Job with their speeches, meaning he's not going to use the same arguments. But as we'll see, that's basically what he does. He does, in fact, use the same arguments that they, that they had made. And he claims he's about to burst in 18 to 20. See, he's under the compulsion of the Spirit. That's his claim, that he, he's inspired, quasi-inspired, semi-inspired. He's got God's spirit in him wanting to teach the truth. He's about to burst. He has to speak. And then in 21 and 22, he says he'll tell it straight. He won't use flattery. He won't use favoritism. He's going to just tell it like it is. And in 33, 1 to 3, he's not only young, but he appears, you see, he's, he's quite full of himself. I think you can see that already in the way he's saying, listen, listen up to me. Uh, I'm inspired, uh, all of that kind of thing. He's full of himself, but he tells Job in 1 to 3 to listen up, that he's going to speak to him with no deceit or no hidden agenda. And then in 4 and 5, he refers again to his connection with the Spirit of God. And he calls Job to stand up and answer him if he can. Now that's pretty bold, right? You're just calling this guy out and say, listen, stand up here and see if you can take what I'm going to throw at you. And in verses 6 and 7, he very patronizingly, he assures Job that he need not fear him because he's only a man like Job. Now what kind of a guy is that? Oh, yeah, you don't have to worry about me. You know, I'm just a man. Oh, really? <laughs> You see, really, so that, that, you know, that's the kind of character that he is. He says in, in, uh, in verse 8, he says he heard what Job said. And then in verses 9 to 11, he misrepresents it. He says he heard what Job said, but no, he misrepresents it. Job never said, I'm pure and without transgression, I'm clean, and there is no iniquity in me, but still God punishes me. Job didn't say that. Job's claim is that his sin doesn't warrant or merit or deserve the level of suffering that he's experiencing, that his suffering is not the result of sin. That's Job's position. And in that, we know Job is correct, right? Because Job is a paragon of righteousness. You cannot get any more righteous than having God say, I pick Job to be the champion of mankind in a contest about whether somebody can be truly pious. Okay, you don't get any, you don't get any uh, more righteous than that. Now, Elihu in verses 10 and 11, he's correct in saying that Job claims God has become his enemy and has put his feet in stocks. Job says that explicitly. Explicitly. 
in chapter 13, verse 24 and 27. See, he believes God is acting against him on trumped up charges. Job feels that God is unjust because he knows his own righteousness. And in 33, in 12 to 13, Elihu says flat out that Job is wrong in claiming that his suffering is not his fault. You see, so when he says, I'm going to make different arguments than the other guys, no, he's not. He claims flat out that Job's wrong in claiming his suffering isn't his fault, and he takes umbrage that Job would dare to cast blame on God in verses 12 and 13. Then in verse 14, he says, God speaks to humans in various ways, but people often don't perceive what God is saying. You see, that God is, in fact, communicating with them. Then in, 19 to, in, in 15 to 18, he says God warns them in dreams. He warns them in dreams to turn from conduct that will lead to death. And then in 19 to 22, he says God likewise, quote, speaks. He likewise speaks by disciplining people with suffering and more specifically with sickness. You see, so he's saying God does speak. He's doing this. He speaks through his disciplining of you in suffering and in sickness. Then in 33, 23 to, 30 to, to 26, he then elaborates on the restoration process that occurs when God disciplines somebody. And he's doing this presumably because he's implying that's your situation, Job. That God is disciplining you. He's speaking to you through this discipline. And here is the restoration process, how it ought to go. And he says, look, if there's a messenger, an angel, one of many, one of a thousand that, would, that are available for the task, who will tell the sufferer what's right for him, if there is such a messenger who will tell the sufferer what's right for him, tell him what he needs to do, that is, tell him that he needs to repent and presumably be heard, well, then in that case, God will spare him from death by forgiving him, by applying this unidentified ransom, and the sick person will thus be fully restored to health. If he will repent, God sends this messenger, he says repent. If the person heeds that message, then God will restore him to health. It's the same message. Repent and you'll be restored to blessings. This person will then pray to God as one restored to God's favor. And he will see God's face with joy for God restores to man righteousness. So this is what Elihu is saying. It's the same thing. If you will but repent, you will enjoy God's favor once again. The restored man, he says in verse 27 and 28, the restored man will sing before men and say, I sinned and perverted what was right, and it was not repaid to me. You see, I was forgiven. He has redeemed my soul from going down into the pit, and my life shall look upon the light. And that last clause, that seems to be a declaration that he will live a faithful life. He will live a life in consciousness of God and in consciousness of God's ways. Now, God does this repeatedly, he says in verses 29 to 30. He does this repeatedly to spare a person's life. So contrary to Job's charge... Elihu's claim is that God's not an enemy, but he's the most faithful of friends. See, he's the most faithful of friends. He's disciplining him for his own good. This is what Elihu is saying. He's disciplining you to get you to repent so you will be restored to life. But you see, this isn't new to Elihu, right? The three friends, they also, they occasionally express that viewpoint. You see, for example, in chapter 5, verse 17 to 22. Now, it's, of course, true that God sometimes works this way. God does indeed bring suffering and hardship into a person's life to get somebody's attention that they are sinning. 
and to bring them, you see, to repentance about over their sin. You can see that, for example, in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. You can see it in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 13, and elsewhere. But Elihu is mistaken. He's mistaken in suggesting that's what's going on in Job's case. That's not what's going on in Job's case. Job's neither being punished nor being disciplined for sin. He's the most righteous among men. So that's not the answer. Though they keep harping on it, that is not the answer. He says in, in 30, 31, verse 31 to 33 of chapter 33, he again tells Job to listen up. And he promises that he's going to teach wisdom to Job. But verse 32, he gives an exception. Job can cease from just listening and can speak up if he has anything to say that's truly exculpatory, such as confessing his fault. You see, if he's got anything to say that falls in that category, well, then he's free to pipe up. Elihu then wants him to speak up because Elihu desires his acquittal or his vindication. So, Job, if you're ready to fast, okay, well, then you can, you can bring that up. If that's when, you know, if you're ready to do that. Then in 34, 1 to 6, he calls for the wise to judge between his position and Job's. He says, Job claims that he's righteous, but that God is treating him unjustly, that he's punishing him as though his claim to be righteous is a lie. And that's how Job feels. Job, I'm righteous, I'm getting killed. And so God is treating me like I'm a sinner Therefore, God is treating me as though my claim to be righteous is not true. Now, the claim in verse 6 that Job is without transgression, well, that's a misrepresentation if it's taken literally. Okay, Job doesn't say I'm literally without transgression, but he does say I'm without transgression in the sense that would justify or merit what's happening to me. Okay, so if you took it literally, then it would be a mis misrepresentation. But as it is, it's a fair assessment of Job's position. That is, Job is saying, listen, I know my life. I know what, how I live. I know what motivates me. And I am not somebody who's a fraud, who deserves, I live my life to serve God. And yet I'm just absolutely getting killed. He says in verses 7 and 9, uh, Elihu says that Job is impervious to the correcting effect of scorn. It says, rather than being influenced by it, corrected by it, Job, Job drinks it in like water. You see, he's bulletproof from the correcting effect of scorn. He accuses Job of being an evildoer. And he char charges Job with denying that there's any benefit in serving God. Now, Job doesn't say that directly, explicitly, but Elihu infers that. And he infers it from Job's insistence that God is pummeling him despite his faithful service. If you're being faithful and living for God and you're getting blasted, well, then what's the benefit of being faithful to God? You see, so he's saying, I'm getting the hammer despite being faithful. God, and this guy who looks at it through this retributive justice, he's saying, no, you're saying then in, in essence that there's no benefit in serving God. So he infers that. Job doesn't say that explicitly. And in chapter 34, in, in 10 to 12, despite having claimed that he would not argue as Job's three friends, he proceeds to make the same fundamental claim they made. He makes the same fundamental claim they made. God treats people according to their actions. You see, that's, that's the rule. That's this absolutist, retributive justice. Everybody's rewarded who does right. Everybody's punished who does wrong. God is just dispensing this like that, see? Uh, contrary to Job's charge, he says that God doesn't twist justice. He doesn't do that, Job. You're saying you're innocent. You're getting the hammer. And you're saying, therefore, he's unjust. And he doesn't do that. If he's giving you the hammer, you are guilty. Period. You're guilty, Job. All we need from you is for you to fess. That's all we need. 
You know, no great depth here, no tricky stuff. We just need you to confess, and then everything will be right with the world. And we know that's not right. You see, that's not right in Job's particular case. He says, look, God doesn't twist judge, uh, justice. That would be a wicked thing, and that would make God guilty. And God isn't twisting justice. You and I know that. They don't know that. See, because we are privy as the readers to a, something that is going on, that God is working something that is not obvious from down below. He has to reveal it. And that's going to be a major part of the overall point of the book and the theology. That's why I'm racing through this because I want to have enough time next week to draw some things together for you like that. In 13 to 15 of 34, he says that God is sovereign and he sustains the world. And the implication being that he's too great to be guilty of the kind of wrong that Job suggests. And then in 34, in 16 to 19, Elihu, he rebukes Job for claiming that God hates justice. For making such a charge against one who is righteous and who's mighty and who governs impartially. And then in, in 20 to 28, in 20 to 28, he says, God sees all of man's steps. However a person may try to hide, God sees all of man's steps. And those who are evildoers, they die by his hand. You see, this is this idea again of retributive justice. Those who are evildoers, they die by his hand, regardless of whether they're rich and powerful. And God, he says, has no need for an investigation. He doesn't have to conduct an investigation to find out who's doing wrong, who's doing right. Because he knows their works. And he crushes them publicly because of their evil and doing such things as oppressing the poor. So again, you see this idea, this is how God works. The bad guy gets the hammer. You sin and mistreat the poor, he crushes you, he kills you. Doesn't matter how much wealth you have. And that's their position and how they continue to argue. God, he says in 29 and 30, that God cannot be condemned for being quiet. You see, for evaluating people and making judgments behind the scenes, because he's still, in fact, administering justice, whether you see it or not. He's behind the scenes and knows all things, and he's still working to bring this about. He is bringing down the guilty. He is punishing the wicked. And rewarding and blessing the faithful. You getting punished, you're wicked. You see, you're wicked. He says in 34 and 31 to 33, he indicates with a rhetorical question that it would be a rare person indeed. See, who after suffering accepted that he had done wrong, but, was who, but who was unaware of what he'd done. He says that would be a rare person whose suffering accepts the conviction that he has in fact done wrong and is suffering for something he did, but he didn't know what it was. He says that would be a rare person, but at least that person would be accepting that the suffering was due to wrong, his wrong, you see, rather than charging God with injustice. And then he asked Job if he thinks God should treat him as he, Job, wishes, despite his rejection of conviction. You see, despite his refusal to acknowledge in principle his wrongdoing, even if you won't put your finger on the very thing you're doing that's prompting this, will you not at least acknowledge in principle that you are the cause of the suffering in that you are sinful? And he says, you won't even do that. He says that's not a decision that Elihu can make for him, and he invites Job to confess his error. And then in 34, that's at 33, in 34 to 37, he asserts that understanding and wise people will agree that Job is speaking in ignorance, and he's speaking without insight. Such people long for Job to be thoroughly examined so his flawed arguments can be exposed. For he answers, Job answers like wicked men, in that he adds to the sin that brought on his suffering. He adds to that sin by his rebellious response to that suffering. 
And he, Job, expresses anger and contempt toward. That's this claps your hands toward. You can see that as an indication of anger and contempt elsewhere. But he expresses anger and contempt toward the wise who are trying to help him. And he multiplies his accusations against God. So he says, you've got people who are trying to set you straight and help you out. And all you are is hostile, prickly, defensive. Won't take, yes, you know, won't take the answer that we're giving you. And Job's over here going, that's because I know it's wrong. That's why I won't do it. Because I know it's wrong. So in 35, 1 to 8, he, he asked, he said, do you think it's just for you to judge God to be unjust? Which you did in declaring, see, that you're right rather than God. For you said there's no advantage in, in ref, refraining from sin. Which is another way of saying that God doesn't give people what they deserve and therefore is unjust. So he frames that, he asks that of him, and then he responds to his own question in 4 to 8. And he replies by arguing that human sin and righteousness, that those things don't harm or benefit God. They don't harm or benefit God. See, they only affect other humans that way. And you're kind of scratching your head saying, so what's his point? Why is he bringing that up? Well, I think the point, the point seems to be that God is not biased in his judgment of situations or cases by people's prior conduct. That he's not biased by that. He's not like a human judge who would favor somebody who had previously benefited him. Let's say in giving a bribe, for example. See, he wouldn't favor somebody who had previously benefited him, nor would he cheat one who had previously harmed him. His impartiality in judging a situation or a case, it isn't compromised by the prior action of the parties. You see, he comes to it, he calls each case and each situation as it is. He is the very opposite of an unjust judge. So I think that's what he's saying. Sometimes it's not always easy. When these guys are talking, you're trying to say, okay, I think I see what you're saying, but why are you saying it? And I think that's what's behind uh, what he's talking about then. Then he says in 35, 9 to 12, he says that the oppressed cry out for, God, for help, but not to God. So they cry out for help but not to God, and when in their pride they don't seek God, he ignores their cries. All right, well, that's a setup, see? He says that, then he says, given that God pays no attention to an empty cry, how much less attention will he pay to Job when he complains that he doesn't see God, that he's waiting on God's appearance for his case that has been laid before him in verses 13 and 14. Job, come on now. You're over here complaining about this. God doesn't answer these empty cries that aren't directed to him. What are you talking about? You see, what are you thinking about? According to Elihu, in verse 15 and 16, because Job is convinced that God's anger doesn't punish transgression. That's how he's, he's looking at this, saying, what is going on? God is unjust. I'm getting the hammer. I'm righteous. I look around and I see cases where the wicked people aren't punished. They live good lives and they die just like everybody else. And so he says, look, because you're convinced God's anger doesn't punish transgression, that you've been emboldened to say foolish things. You've been emboldened by that misapprehension, according to Elihu, to say foolish things. And in 36, 1 to 4, Elihu, he urges the listeners to bear with him because he's God's spokesman. You see, this is Elihu's claim. He's God's spokesman. He gets his knowledge from God. I think that's implicit in this from afar. You see, he gets his knowledge from God and his words are true. Indeed, he's, he's before them as one perfect in knowledge. He's before them as one perfect in knowledge. Do you see, his claim is... I hear all you guys talking, but listen, wisdom doesn't come with age or through tradition and the collective wisdom of people. No, no, no. It's something that God gives somebody, and guess what? I have it. 
I have it. You see? He doesn't. But he claims. And that is one of the sources of wisdom in society where people claim. Does God inspire some people? He does. But is everybody who claims to be inspired by God inspired by God? No. And so, but that's his claim, you see. And then in verses 5 to 15 of 36, he announces that God is great and he doesn't despise great strength of heart. Now, what Elihu means by that, I think, is that contrary to what they may be thinking when they hear him say that he's perfect in knowledge, well, I suspect people are chapped at that, thinking, what are you, listen to this clown. But he then says, you see, that God doesn't despise great strength of heart, meaning that contrary to what some may be thinking about what he just said, God is not displeased with the boldness of his words in claiming to be this spokesman for God and in claiming to be inspired by God. Then he says in verses 6 and 7, he declares that God takes care of the innocent and punishes the wicked. Well, that's what we've heard all along. Retribution theology. Bad, doomed, good, blessing. Doom, blessing, doom, blessing, that's it. That's what we've heard. He says in 8 to 12 that those suffering are being disciplined by God. If they repent, they will be restored by God. All right, so you see, he says, I'm not going to argue this way. No, but you are arguing that way. You're saying essentially the same thing although you are emphasizing the disciplinary aspect of suffering over the punitive aspect of suffering, but you're still saying it's because of Job's sin and the solution is for Job to repent. You see, that's the, that's the solution. And he says, look, if they repent, they'll be restored by God, he says in the end of 8 to 12, but if they refuse, they will perish. If you refuse to repent at God's disciplinary suffering... If you won't hear the message, then you will perish. Now that latter group, that's, that's the group in which Elihu puts Job. He says there in, in verse 13 to 14 that they're godless and simply will not turn despite the discipline that God gives them. And as a result, they die young and they die in humiliating circumstances. You see, Job has said, no, there are cases where the wicked go ahead. And he says, you can ask anybody. Just pull a traveler off the street and he'll tell you that's the truth. These people will not have it. They just look in here and say, nope. Wicked die young and they die in horrible circumstances. You see, they will not be honest. And that's going to play in when God winds up saying, ultimately, you guys didn't speak right. It's this is at the, at the core of it, is that they would not be honest in dealing with things. You see, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't treat things as they, as they should. And that sums up, right, the idea of, of his idea of disciplinary suffering. He sums it up in 3615, where he says, God uses suffering to save sinners from their sin and to put them on the right path. Now, again, God does, of course, sometimes do that, but it's a mistake to stuff all suffering in that category. You see, it's a mistake because God is a being. He is a person. He has reasons and rationales and he's doing things and he's painting a tapestry from so far above where we are. He's not a slot machine who simply goes. He does things and he can have reasons for doing things that don't fit the categories. And when that happens, it stresses us out and we have different responses to that and this response is to deny that he does it and God is not happy with that he doesn't like that 36 16 to 21 he says if Job were willing God would have brought him would have brought him to a place of blessing through the suffering he'd inflicted upon him but he wasn't so because he wasn't he continues to suffer the judgment of the wicked he says in verses 16 and 17. Then in verse 18, he warns Job not to let his anger lead him to scoff at God's discipline and not to let the seemingly great cost, you see, the ransom, not to let the seemingly great cost of confession and repentance after maintaining steadfastly his innocence prevent him from doing so. 
You see, so he's saying, listen, I recognize that once you've gone out on that limb and said, I'm righteous, 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 no, 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 that there's a tremendous cost at that point to coming up and saying, I lied. <laughs> and he's telling him, you see, how, you see how this is? How saying, listen, Job, I understand that it'd be a great cost and very hard, but don't let that stop you. Don't let that stop you from confessing your sin even at this hour. After all that you've said, and God will bring you through, and you will then be free, and you'll be, uh, you know, you'll be restored. He says in 19, neither his cry nor strength will substitute for repentance to keep him from distress. There's only one ticket out of this, and that's you repenting. And in 20 to 21, he warns Job not to long for the cover of darkness in which his presumed sin can go unnoticed and not to turn even more toward evil, which his refusal to repent shows that he values more than the suffering his evil brings. So he's saying, don't do that. You know, don't long for darkness. Don't run deeper into the sin that I'm telling you you're involved in, which is not true. But don't run deeper into it. Then he says in 36, in 22, to 22 and 23, he says God has no equal in power, that he's sovereign, that he's above any challenge to his conduct, implying that Job has no business charging God with wrongdoing. He also said that God has no equal in teaching ability. See, the implication there is that Job's failure to learn the lesson from God's discipline lies with Job. It's not God's uh, fault as a crummy teacher. You're not learning the lesson that God's trying to teach you because you simply don't want to learn. He says, and he, he then extols God's greatness. And he focuses in verses 27 to 33 on God's control of storms. And the point being that he's not to be treated as Job is treating him. Look at the majesty of this being. And look how you're talking about him. That he's unjust. 37, 1 to 13. He says he continues with his depiction of God's awesome power. As manifested in, his, in storms, including snowstorms. And he says God marks his great storm work as his. He seals it, marks it as his by the hand of man. In that, man ceases agricultural work in response to God's storm work. You see, that's the sign. This is from God. It's that large. That's significant. The New English translation translates verse 7. He says he causes everyone to stop working so that all people may know his work. And the wild animals, in verse 8, he says, the wild animals retreat into their lairs when God goes about his great storm work. And that response to the size and the magnificence of the storm he brings is the seal that it is his work. That's what I think he's talking about there. Then in verse 13, he says he does it with a purpose. And the point of that is that, see, he does his storm work with a purpose just as he has a purpose behind the storms of suffering. He has a purpose for that. And the purpose is to convict you, to bring you to repentance that you might be restored. And you are steadfastly refusing it, Job. You're steadfastly refusing the purpose why he has brought this suffering into your life. 37 and 14 to 20, he calls Job to ponder the awesome works of God and to recognize God's vast superiority, the vast superiority of his knowledge and his ability. And then in verse 19, he takes this sarcastic uh, jab at Job's presumption in thinking that he can put God in the wrong. Of course, Job recognizes the power of God, right? I mean, Job says that in many places. He says in chapter 9, verses 4 to 10, but he believes that that great power, in his case, is being exercised unjustly. And he fears that that great power will prevent him from getting a fair shake if he can ever get in the courtroom with him. 
You see, so, but he's aware of his power. There's no question about that. Now, these questions that Elihu brings up, these questions anticipate the questions in the following chapters that God is going to raise. But you see, Elihu is implying in his questions that Job's ignorance of God's ways, that somehow that translates into accepting that God is disciplining him for sin. See, what Job knows isn't true. That's not the case. Now, when God himself raises these kinds of questions, when God does that, there's not only this transforming effect of the theophany, the appearance of God himself, which humbles a person experientially. You see, there's not only this transforming humility or humiliation of Job that comes from the appearance of God, but also God knows the truth, unlike Elihu, who's stuck in this false idea. God knows the truth, so his questions have a different import. See, God's surpassing greatness, and this will be part if I have time next week. God's surpassing greatness means trusting his character despite the dissonance that's caused by the seemingly inconsistent facts of great suffering and righteousness. You see, this is what Job is experiencing. It is a fact that he's suffering greatly, and it is a fact that he is a righteous man. And so that creates this dissonance. And because of his theology that he shares with them of retribution theology, he can't make sense of it. So he chooses door A. He will be honest with the suffering, honest with his righteousness. His door A is God's unjust. He's unjust. His friends, in their view, all right, we see this, you are suffering, but God is just, you are unrighteous. There's another answer that, to which we are privy, you see, as readers. And that's going to factor, as I say, that's part of the thing. There are, there are things that are beyond the grasp of human wisdom. And there are things that we cannot understand unless God lifts the curtain and shows us. You see, and that's, that's, this is one of those cases. The reader has had the curtain lifted. Those living it have not. And so there's a big point there about how, how we are to understand and relate to some of these things. All right, in 21 to 24, he, he closes his long address by indicating that God is too splendid and glorious to be found, just like one can't look at the sun in the sky on a clear day. God's too glorious to be found. So it's no surprise that Job can't have a face-to-face, he says in 21 to 23a. And contrary to Job's claim, God is just and righteous. That's the end of the story. That's 23b, period. God is just. God is righteous. That's it. So your claim's uh, off. It's wrong. So indeed, that's, that's why wise people fear God. And the implication being that Job is not wise because based on his irreverence toward God and charging God with injustice, he doesn't fear God. Now, when Elihu finishes speaking, no one responds to him. He finishes speaking, there is no response, and he's not heard from again. It's like his stuff just went into a black hole. You see? And that, that probably indicates that he didn't have anything new to add in terms of argument. We've already battled and gone and almost to the point of tedium with these things back and forth, groping, groping, groping. Can human wisdom find an answer? And we just say, no, it's not, get, it's not progressing. We think it's over. Here comes Elihu. Like I said, the television show. Is that second bell? All right. Where somebody pops out of the closet when you think everything's over. And he comes up and he says these kinds of things, you see. He winds up uh, uh, delivering these, these basically the same points, but he puts greater emphasis. He puts a greater emphasis on the, on the disciplinary sermon, but he really is making no new argument. And, and you say, well, okay, if he's not really saying anything new in terms of s- substance, in terms of the argument, 
What's the function of his speech in the book? See, why is he in there? Is he just showing even more the futility? You see, I think there's something to what Longman says is that the difference isn't in the novelty of the argument that he makes, but in the ground from which he argues. You see, as Longman points out, Longman says right at the start, he distances himself from the friends who've based their wisdom on the tradition of the fathers and the experiences of old age. Elihu, for his part, claims a spiritual wisdom. You know, this idea of inspiration. See, he, he, thus he represents yet another human pretension to wisdom, a false kind of spirituality that leads to error rather than insight. He's really full of himself and has confused his misunderstanding with the actual inspiration of God. And that's always a danger. But you see that very much there in Elihu. Now the fact is, is that Elihu does not speak as God's mouthpiece. He is not inspired by God. Do you see? In these things that he's saying. He simply repeats, as Longman says, the tired retribution theology of the three friends. He accuses Job of being a sinner who's suffering because of his sin. And as a result, Job needs to repent. Right, he's saying this throughout. Now... We get to the appearance of Yahweh. All right, we've gone on along with everybody. Telling, and Job's just going, I want to bring my case. Where is he? Where is he? I want to bring my case. I want to bring my case. He's being unjust. No, you're not. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. Confess, confess. We've gone all through this. Job's friends and Elihu, they insisted that the solution was Job's repentance. Okay? If, his, if he would just turn from his sin for which he's being punished or being disciplined, God would restore him. And on the other hand, Job believes that the solution was in confronting God, establishing in the courtroom with God that he's being unjustly treated. Show your case. Where is your case to justify treating me like this? So that's Job's perspective. Well, in chapter 38, he gets an audience with God. He gets an audience, but it's God who confronts Job rather than the other way around. It's God who confronts Job. In 38, 1 to 3, Yahweh answers Job from a whirlwind. See, meaning a storm, see, which is a threatening manifestation that suggests his anger or displeasure with Job. And that disposition is made clear with the rhetorical question that he asks, who's this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? He's saying that Job's ignorant words confuse the issue. And thus they darken correct advice in the sense of they obscure correct advice, correct counsel, making that advice, that path, that counsel difficult to perceive or discern. And God then announces his intention to demonstrate Job's ignorance and to show who's God and who's creature. You see, telling him to brace himself to answer his questions. Then he says in verses, in verses 4 to 7, he asked Job, Job questions about creation that neither Job nor any human could answer. Nobody could answer that. No human was present at that time. So God says, hey, you go ahead. Uh, you're sitting in judgment of me? Uh, here, let, let's, play a little, let's play a little quiz show. Ask him all these questions about creation. Answer them, Job. We can't. As I say, nor could any human. In 8 to 11, God continues speaking of creation. This time he alludes to the events of Genesis 1, 9, and 10, where he created the sea by gathering together into the place he determined the water that was covering the land, and the bars and doors, that represents the sea's containment. And the clouds and the thick darkness represent the inscrutability with which God endowed the sea at creation. The sea is a black box, and it is still pretty much a black box to us today. You see, you just can't get in. And that was his work, not man's. I heard that bell. And he's going to go through. And I don't know, I'm, I'm going to race next week just because I say I want to leave myself some time to finish. I'm going as fast as I can. Uh, all of these things are going to be, he's saying, that was my work, not man's. My work, not man's. 
You see, and so he'll go through and lead this, but ultimately you're going to see that he, he favors what Job is doing over what these other people are doing. He says, Job has spoken right about me. You guys didn't. In what sense did Job speak right? Well, I hope I have time to, to pull all that out. But anyway, thanks for coming.